You know, you're going, man, aren't you afraid to, uh, aren't you afraid to tell jokes like that? No, folks, because uh, I'm not worried about hell. You know, just think about going to hell? No, no. Because I was married for two fucking years! Hell would be like club man! I remember being a kid and watching Back to School for the very first time. While it's one of those 80s comedies that I can watch endlessly and never tire of, nothing can compare to seeing a particular scene in that movie for the first time. I was up to my knees in rice patties with Johnson Edward going up against Charlie, slugging it out with him, while pussies like you were back there partying, putting headbands on, doing drugs, listening to the goddamn Beatle albums! Uh, uh. I had no idea who this guy was or why the movie seemed to take a pause to shine a spotlight on him for a brief moment. I hadn't seen him in any other movies, but more importantly, I hadn't even seen anything like him in other movies. It wasn't until I got older that I realized why this scene stuck out to me so much. I had just witnessed the lone cinematic output of Sam Kinison. I like the way you think. I'm gonna be watching you. I think most of us growing up in the 90s were just not exposed to Sam Kinison the same way that those growing up in the 80s were. This is compounded by the fact that he died tragically young at the start of the decade, but also because he left so little material behind for us to look at. I'm not talking about stand-up specials and albums, but rather film and television projects. Unlike most of his contemporaries in stand-up comedy, Kinison never got that one big star vehicle. I mean, take for instance Rodney's career. Most of us discovered him when we were kids thanks to movies like Back to School, Ladybugs, and Rover Dangerfield. And then as we got older, we could then discover his amazing stand-up as well. With Kinnison, we never had those series of movies to introduce us to him, just a couple of small parts and cameos. What's it gonna take to convince you that I'm your guardian angel? Fly around, play a harp. <laughs> hey, I'm an angel, not Tommy Chung. <laughs> but those who are alive to witness his rise to stardom, you know there has been no one in stand-up comedy quite like Sam Kinison. And we were driving out here a day across the desert and it occurred to us there wouldn't be world hunger if you people would live where the food is! <laughs> live in, the in an age when comedians regularly sell out football stadiums, it can be easy to overlook just how trailblazing Kinison's career was. He was the first rock star comedian. And not just because of the size of the venues he sold out, but because he literally was a rock star comedian. Usually clad in a beret, and later a bandana, Kinnison would take to the stage and unleash upon his audience, the Tasmanian devil of comedy. I'm attracted to heartbreakers. I am. I love those women. You go up to them, and they go, hi, hi there, hi. Listen, is that your heart? <laughs> That's my kind of girl. If you know anything about him, you'll know that he had a habit to be, let's just say, a little loud. But beyond that, Sam Kinison was a radical entertainer, who spoke his mind freely, had no regrets, and pissed off everyone equally. Maybe it was in bad taste, but I'm a triple X rated fucking comedian. People count on me for fucking bad taste. Last month, I made a video exploring the lost deleted scenes from Three Amigos, one of which was a scene that featured Sam Kinison as a crazed mountain man. In doing research for that video, I stumbled upon a book called Brother Sam, written by Sam's brother Bill and Steve Delson, that chronicled his spectacular career. Using that book and interview clips I found around the internet, I want to present Sam's story and showcase why his comedy is still worth discussing today. Because you people are going to wish to GOD YOU NEVER SAW ME! Although Sam Kinison was born in 1953, his story really begins several years later, when chasing a ball into the street, three-year-old Sam was hit by a truck. Though he walked away with only minor scrapes and bruises on the outside, it seemed to affect something deep within him, as following the accident, the once timid, quiet kid transformed into an erratic, sometimes aggressive child, which fundamentally affected the rest of his life. Sam's father was a Pentecostal preacher, and though he originally tried to follow in his footsteps, he could not find the same success as his fathers and brothers had in that field. Were you a serious minister? Yeah, I was. I was. I just have uh, kind of a relationship with God, you know? 
kind of like Colonel Sanders fried chicken. It's got several secret herbs and spices. Why did you leave it? Uh, that I, was a good moneymaker, wasn't it? I became disillusioned. I, I was never into the offering side of it. You know, I'd pull out a basket and I'd say, hey, if I blessed you and you want to bless me, here's the basket. I didn't do very well, actually. <laughs> you were not a good minister. No. Well, not financially. I didn't, I didn't rake in the bucks. Sam's approach to preaching was not unlike his style as a comedian, and the experience gave him confidence in performing in front of large crowds. Well, I had no choice, because there was something down inside me that kept me excited. You can fight me, but you can't excite me. You can thrill me, but you can't kill me. Oh, well, anyway, yeah, somebody, I, uh, it was like that. It was like that. It was like that. It was while on the road preaching with his brothers as a teen that Sam discovered the comedy albums of Rudy Ray Moore, Richard Pryor, and Lenny Bruce. Hey, Richard Pryor, come on, Eddie Murphy, all these guys, man. Yeah. George Carlin, yeah. Lenny Bruce, all these guys are going to go, yeah, I'm the best, I'm the best. You know, no, there is no best. It's a rainbow, and you get a shade in it if you're lucky. By the time he was 25, he was barely making ends meet as a preacher, and he decided it was time for a career change. When he saw an ad in a Tulsa newspaper for a week-long comedy school in Houston, Texas, he figured, what the hell. While Sam was always naturally funny, the school gave him a chance to really hone his craft. By the following year, he was one of the most popular comedians in Houston. You know, I, I administered and I knew how to speak in public and, and, and basically hold the attention of a crowd, but I didn't know how to walk out there and do jokes, you know? My jokes were embarrassing. I used to put on a, a, a pair of underwear over my clothes and sing, I'm Mr. Lonely. Performing at the Comedy Annex, Sam became an integral part of a group known as the Texas Outlaw Comics, which also included Bill Hicks and Carl LeBove, who will go on to become a lifelong friend of Sam's. As a comedian, Sam never rehearsed his sets. He just got up on stage and talked about what was on his mind. Sometimes it was simple observations. Other times he riffed on the religious themes he had touched on as a preacher. 30, 40 Christians standing around going, <laughs> it's a shame that he has to die. And Jesus is going, well, maybe I wouldn't have to. Somebody get a ladder and a pair of pliers. <laughs> One night while visiting Houston on tour, Rodney Dangerfield stopped in the annex and caught Sam's act, later pulling him aside and praising him personally. He really seems to care about what I have no idea. As successful as Sam was getting in Houston though, he felt like he was starting to hit a ceiling and yearned for something bigger. Feeling confident in his abilities, especially after a Dallas newspaper named him the funniest man in Texas two years in a row, Sam moved to LA in 1980. He quickly realized that the L.A. comedy scene was far different from the one in Houston, though. L.A. was filled with hundreds of stand-up hopefuls, and the only window Sam could find to perform was Monday night at the famous comedy store, working as a doorman at the club the rest of the week. While Sam continued to get better at comedy, he was failing to capture the same success he had found in Houston. Then, one night before a set, Sam got into an argument with his then-wife Terry, and he took to the stage with a bottled-up fresh rage that came out in his comedy. <laughs> What's your name? Michael? Well, Michael, if you ever think about getting married, if you ever think you've met the right woman, you want to settle down, change your life, will you do me a favor, Mike? Remember this face. <laughs> While Sam had always been a little loud in his delivery, this event sparked a change in his act going forward. His anger, whether real or played up for the audience, became an instrumental part of his delivery. This anger has sometimes been mistaken as being all Sam's comedy was about, which wasn't the case, as it also consisted of observational comedy that was delivered in a much calmer fashion. Yeah, listen, Jesus. Yeah, listen, four or five of us went fishing last night. We've got our sweaters. And uh, we've kind of got a cold, and we're not going to be able to walk to Jerusalem with you today. Uh, what? We're healed. <laughs> Though Sam gradually got more exposure and even better opportunities to perform at the comedy store, he still couldn't seem to fully break into show business. Man, five years in L.A. at the comedy room, and uh, uh, I had so many guys come and see me and go, man, you're great and you're funny, but exactly, what if we can't do nothing with you. At this time, to help him manage his career, Sam brought in his older brother, Bill, who to this day remains an ambassador of Sam's work. Then, in 1985, Sam's old friend Rodney Dangerfield offered him a spot 
on his ninth Young Comedian special for HBO. Though he was reluctant to partake, Rodney convinced him it would be a great opportunity to get his act seen by important people. For his set, Sam took to the stage, and immediately launched into what would become one of his most famous bits. You see this? Huh? Sis? This is sand! Yeah! It's sand! You know it's gonna be 100 years from now, huh? It's gonna be sand! Upon airing on August 5th, 1985, the special launched Sam into superstardom, and offers finally came flooding in. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Sam Kinison! Brace yourselves. I'm not kidding. Please welcome Sam Kinison. And if you haven't seen him before, you're gonna get a kick out of bad Sam, okay? Sammy Way, Sam While success in Hollywood had been slow to start, Sam found himself quickly playing catch up with the industry. And then of course, uh, in 1985, I was, uh, Rodney Dangerfield put me on the ninth annual Comedians special and all of a sudden they found things they could do with me. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it only took him five years, so I'm gonna thank him for that. Over the next several months, Sam found himself making an appearance on David Letterman, putting together his first comedy album, Louder Than Hell, and even making history as the first comedian hired to perform his act on SNL. While other comics had been hired to host, Sam would be the first ever hired to just perform stand-up, in an episode hosted by John Lithgow with musical guest Mr. Mister. Jesus is the only guy that ever came back from the dead that didn't scare everybody. It's like it was alright for this guy, you know, it's been like three days, like people didn't go, oh, oh, oh! HBO also wanted him for his very own stand-up special. What they do is they put like five to seven pounds on a year. Nothing you notice immediately. <laughs> Nothing you notice right off, boy. And then about nine or ten years, you realize you're living with their mom! <laughs> Perhaps the best offer once again came from Brody Dangerfield, though, who wanted to work with Sam, this time in a feature film and push those rice eaters back to the Great Wall of China and take the first brick, brick, brick and nuke them back into the fucking Stone Age River! How come? Tell me why! Say it! Say it! Back to School was conceived as the second starring film vehicle for Rodney Dangerfield. Following the success of his appearance on the HBO special, Rodney had the writers insert scenes for Sam after the script had been finished. Sam would play Professor Turgeson, a Vietnam War vet turned history professor. I mean, I hold history very sacred sacred. The way the farmer looks at the earth and he holds it sacred. The way a Christian takes the Bible and he holds it sacred. The way a lot of people hold their marriage sacred. In his brief scenes, Sam showed Hollywood producers that his act could be easily replicated on film. Good answer. Good answer. He earned even more attention when the movie became a massive hit upon its release in June 1986. Uh, this, this motion picture, this uh, Rodney Dangerfield Back to School, is uh, getting great reviews and doing big business. You're in the thing. I'm in the film. We have a little bit of you at work you here. you have a clip here? Do we have a clip? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, uh, what, tell them what it is and let's take a look at it. Okay, Wait. I play a... Uh... Hurry up! As big of a hit as Back to School was, Sam struggled to find his next movie. The first potential project came in the form of a supporting part in Jumpin' Jack Flash, though Whoopi Goldberg later nixed his casting. Next up was a small part in Three Amigos. I've covered this topic in another video, but essentially what happened was Sam filmed a part as a crazed mountain man that was later cut, and sadly no footage of his scenes have ever surfaced. We hoped it was right, we didn't know! Nobody helps you figure this shit out. The third potential project was an infamous comedy script called A Took. The Fish Out of Water script, based on a 1963 novel, had originally been written for John Belushi, but was now being dusted off as a starring vehicle for Sam Kinison. He didn't love the script, but his newly hired Hollywood agent, Elliot Abbott, said that the studio encouraged Sam to rewrite the script with his comedy buddies. When Sam showed up on set, though, clad in his full Inuit costume, he found out that the studio, United Artists, knew nothing of his rewrites and wanted him to film the script as is. Elliot blamed Sam, Sam blamed Elliot, and the all-around miscommunication caused the studio to shut down the movie after just eight days. While Sam was released from the movie, the whole debacle made other studios dubious of entering into film contracts with him. Even so, Sam did not need movies to be successful, as his album, Louder Than Hell, was a tremendous hit, as was his first special. 
He began to sell out concert venues all over the country as a result. With more money pouring in than ever before, Sam found his lifestyle rapidly changing. Though he used to take the stage clad in a beret and long overcoat, Sam started dressing in expensive outfits that featured extravagant scarves and jewelry, looking more like a pirate than a comic. What kind of necklace is that? Oh, well, I bought this at Lorenzo's on Sunset, where, I get, where a fat guy can look cool. <laughs> and, uh, Does it symbolize anything? No, no, just look cool. Oh, okay, because there's like a continent on there. Or yeah, it's like weird stuff, isn't it? And I said, is this, is this all right if I wear this? This doesn't mean anything like sexual, right? They went, no. So I don't want some guy coming to go, I have the match. <laughs> Sam had always had a reputation as being the life of the party, but now, with more income than ever before, his partying began to cause problems behind the scenes. He frequently missed interviews and other important engagements due to oversleeping after long benders. You've done some drugs in your life. Well, Tylenol, maximum dosage, yes. but you know. <laughs> over, over the period of my life? Oh yeah, well, yeah. I've been married twice, my God. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. While he may have been blacklisted from Hollywood as a result, he continued to dominate on tour, selling out venues across the country. As Sam found himself being treated like a rock star, he began to incorporate rock into his performances. He started ending his comedy sets with musical encores, which were basically all-star jam sessions with his rock star buddies. Sam had been playing guitar since age 15, and wanted to be taken seriously as a musician as well as a comedian. This culminated with a cover of Wild Thing in 1988, which even earned him a Grammy nomination for Best Comedy Recording that year. Wild thing, I think you move me! Ah, it just came to my mind, I thought I'd say that. This newfound success in rock only added to Sam's problems, though. His stand-up tours now became elaborate, expensive productions with a payroll that included comics, rock stars, roadies, and dancers, all of whom enabled Sam's hard-partying lifestyle. Hey, Jen. <laughs> I don't want to bring the party down, but I can't move my left arm and there's a ring in my ear and, uh... You know, I'm rolling a... Does anybody get any downers? I'll drink shoe polish, anything, just... Still, the attention from his Grammy nomination made Hollywood take interest in his career once again. In 1989, he was finally invited to be a guest on The Tonight Show. <laughs> Sam, you are deeply disturbed, you know that. <laughs> yeah. The appearance went well and resulted in film and television offers to start coming back in. The first was a guest spot on Fox's popular sitcom Married with Children. The one-hour special episode, a parody of It's a Wonderful Life, saw Sam as Al Bundy's guardian angel. Uh, she doesn't know you're there, Bundy. Just like when you're having sex. <laughs> the episode was the most viewed of the season, and Fox quickly saw potential in giving Sam his own sitcom. By 1990, Sam was feeling dejected, seeing other crass comics like Andrew Dice Clay get their own movie vehicles. Hey, right. it's gonna be the biggest movie of the year! Oh! How <laughs> grossing movie the ever! 40 million yes. the first weekend! I'm gonna be the biggest box of a star bar none of all time! Oh! But now, after an appearance on Married with Children, his film career finally looked on the rise. After a health scare the year before, Sam had drastically begun to cut back on his drinking and use of hard drugs. In turn, he became much more reliable, showing up on time and ready for studio meetings. So anyway, since March 2nd, this is my 80, I think it's 85 days that I haven't had any shit. Hopefully we'll be around a long time. Following his appearance on Married with Children, Fox offered him the lead in a sitcom called Charlie Hoover. Dr. Magoo is going to take a very sharp knife and go where no man has gone before. I hope. Sam would play Charlie's inner conscience, who would materialize as a one-foot alter ego named Hugh. Go away. Can't do that, Chuck. I mean, yeah, you're having a midlife crisis, I'm it. Though the series was canceled after just seven episodes had aired in 1991, the experience showed Hollywood executives that Sam could be trusted and relied upon to show up for projects. It's one long, monotonous every day is the same as the one before it out. I mean, I know honest people having more fun than you. <laughs> With a renewed lease on life and a career as an actor finally on the horizon, the future looked bright for Sam. Well, I love you too, man. I just want to be alive to make you laugh, man. That's all. Then, tragedy struck. On April 10th, 1992, while traveling to a gig at Riverside Casino in Nevada, Sam's Pontiac Turbo Trans Am was struck head-on by a drunk driver in a pickup truck. Sam died just moments later at 38 years old. 
You either love him or hate him, but Sam Kinison embodied everything a stand-up comedian should be. He freely spoke his mind and refused to let anyone tell him what he could or could not say. NBC is going to allow you to come out here and say whatever you want, with no authority, no scissors, nobody watching you. It may have alienated him from Hollywood, but when looking at his comedy today, it's so evident just how unafraid he was to speak his mind. I'm living exactly the way I think you'd want me to live. People rightfully disagreed with him, while others agreed and celebrated him. But the one thing no one could ever do was change him.